You're listening to the Pimp Cron Podcast. Welcome one and all to episode 148 of the Pimp Cron Warhammer Podcast. We are brought to you by our beautiful, sexy, well-endowed, super virulent Patreon patrons. And we're also brought to you today by the equally sexy GameMat.eu for pre-painted terrain and beautiful mouse pad game mats, essentially. Um, They're not the size of a mouse pad. They're actually... it. Uh, I'm not good with numbers. At least twice the size of a mouse pad. They're at least twice the size. Maybe two and a half times the size of a mouse pad. Anyway, no, they're regular size. Anyway, so what are we talking about tonight? We are talking about whether or not I want the Dominion box for Age of Sigmar 3.0. We are also responding to a voicemail from Mudkip, which it really pleases me that I'm starting to get so many voicemails. Makes me happy. And then we talk about all the superstitions in wargaming and, you know, stuff like that, basically. Man, what have I been up to? Well, um... A lot of work, and besides that, I played a game this week with Just James. We teamed up against a new guy and another guy from our group, and I gotta tell you, you know, there's one thing about being polite, right? You can be polite in things, but then you can be overly polite, and I gotta tell you, there's very few people more polite than me. I always try to look out for people's feelings. I always try to look out... For me being rude, I mean, I'm phobic about me being in someone's way or me inconveniencing someone else if I can help it, that sort of thing. So this new guy, and I hate to rag on him, he was extremely nice, but have you ever met somebody that says sorry over every single freaking thing? And we used to have a, well, I mean, we still have a friend, Connor, but he used to be really bad about this when he first started our, our gaming group. And I used to say, okay, listen, Connor, the next time you say sorry, I am going to deduct the victory point. Okay, this is the agreement now. Every time you say sorry, then I'm going to deduct the victory point. And we never really did. I mean, I did like fake keep a score system where he would inevitably lose every game because he'd be like in the negatives because he'd say sorry so much. But he's much better now. We've kind of cured him of that. So this new guy, he said he'd played Warhammer before. And I was like, oh, good, okay, so at least you know the the basics. He said he played back in 8th edition a bit. I'm like, cool, nice. So then he's like, alright, um, how do I deploy? And I'm like, well, we're, okay, so we're going to take turns, and you place down a unit, and then I place down a unit, and whatever. And he goes, okay, uh, what's a unit? Is it just one model? And I'm thinking to myself, well, I mean, I think the definition of a unit is usually more than one person. I didn't say this, of course. I was being polite. Um... And he's like, I'm like, oh, no, it's it's a whole group of people. He's like, oh, OK. So then he, he, he you know, we eventually got down deployment. And I just said it's 12 inches. We were doing Dawn of War. We weren't even doing a real mission. We were just making something up. And um, he had a, a hard time with unit coherency and all that. But then when it came to movement, he's like, uh, wh- how do I move? I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I thought you said you've played Warhammer before. Like, this is not. So we give him a tape measure and uh, he measures out six inches, but he's pointing the tape measure towards him, which is the most awkward way to possibly do that. And he's like, well, how do I move my models? (laughs) And I'm like, what? (laughs) So we had to very calmly and very gently, not making fun of him at all, like I'm doing right now. And uh, we showed him how to move his models and all that. But I'm thinking, you said you've played Warhammer before. These are the extreme basics of Warhammer. But I don't know. Maybe he just played one game or something. I don't know. He was a very nice guy. But uh, then he kept saying, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. And finally, I was like, all right, listen up, okay? If you say sorry again, we're going to jump you in the parking lot when this is all done. I'm just letting you know. And, of course, you know, he, he knew it was a joke. But I'm trying to get my point across. Stop saying you're sorry. Like, it is the, huh, it's one of my pet peeves. People that say sorry always seem like they're very insecure. And if you are obviously not doing anything to try to harm somebody, then don't say you're sorry. Like, there's no... Ugh. Anyway. So, anyway, we... It was kind of a painful game. Because 
Just James and I won. We didn't win by some giant margin. I don't even remember what the score was because I was about falling asleep by the end of the game. Because uh, in the very first turn, it took us like 45 minutes to deploy and get the first game turn started. Because he was like, oh, I don't know how to move my models. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And he's like, here, he hands the tape measure to his his partner, which is one of our normal gaming guys. And But our, one of our normal gaming guys is also extremely, like, shy, and he's got some other things going on. And he's like, well, here, you move the unit. And I'm like, the other guy grabs the tape measure, and he's like, oh, uh, no, you move it. And then he's like, no, no, can, can you move that unit for me? And the guy hands him back the tape measure and goes, no, man, it's your, it's your unit. You just, you, you, you move it. I don't know where to move it. And I was like, dear God, someone move the effing models seriously they have a six inch movement don't move farther than six inches but go in any direction you please for the love of all that is holy so anyway <laughs> i hate to i hate to rag on new people that's why i'm not saying his name or anything but uh hopefully he comes back and hopefully he remembers how to move models because good god i was i was about to pull my hair out and trust me i don't have a lot of hair left so Anyway, um, worked on the brutality supplement and, um, I green stuffed a, oh man, you're going to like this. So I've made a Sesame Street and a Muppet Warband for brutality with Kermit the Frog, Miss Piggy, um, Fozzie Bear throwing grenades, um, an Owl Bear made into Big Bird. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Trust me. It is Cookie Monster covered in blood like he just ate someone. Ernie and Bert on the same base as a black and white mage. And finally, I think I've told you this about about this before, but whatever. I, I repeat myself all the time. Point is, is my newest one is I bought a goblin riding a rooster from the store owner, JD. And I ripped off the goblin and I put another model on there riding it. And then I green stuffed a gonzo head. So it is gonzo riding a giant chicken. Because if you guys recall, gonzo loves chickens. Gonzo riding a giant chicken with a saddle, and I bought online, because the store didn't have any, two tiny 28mm chickens to be his minions. So I'm going to make him a dominant in brutality with two chicken minions, and I gotta tell you, I am tickled pink. I uh, just primed him the other night, I have not painted him yet, but he's going to be a welcome addition to my Muppets Warband. <laughs> so, if that doesn't sound ridiculous, I don't know what will. By the way, I want to mention to you all that I am starting a YouTube channel called Pemcron TV, without the second P, Pemcron. If you guys could take a look at it, I'd greatly appreciate it. Like and subscribe and all that stuff. Hopefully share some of them because I'm trying to get the ball rolling on this YouTube channel. Well, that is it. I've taken enough of your time. Let's get on to the first segment. Let's open the Tesseract mailbox. I gotta say, for this Tesseract mailbox, I'm pretty excited, because Levi called in the couple weeks ago, and we got to talk to him. I left a voicemail. And now, this week, we have Hidden Mudkip calling in, and I gotta tell you, you're gonna love this guy's accent. Like, I don't know if he's putting it on, or, like, he's theatrically trained, maybe he's doing a, an accent, I don't know, but I, to be honest, this guy needs to be narrating books. Uh, Mudkip... If you're listening, hopefully you are. You need to be narrating books as an audiobook guy. You need to, because you got the voice for it. It's fantastic. I listened to the voicemail message several times. And uh, anyway, okay, before this gets too weird, let's listen to what he says. Pimpest of pimps, croniest of crons, I have but a simple question for you. Now, here's the thing. I would like to make a vanguard marine force with infiltrators as troops. But ever since GW changed scouts to elites, it has made me paranoid and worried that if I do build this army, the vast majority of it will be rendered redundant, forced to the elite slot that is already overcrowded, as you well know. Do you think GW will change infiltrators to troops anytime, no, sorry, to elites anytime soon? Or should I continue ahead with my plans and build the vanguard force I've always wanted? Thank you, O oh Mighty One, O oh greatest of pimps and greatest of crons, and in fact, the pimpus of necrons. Have a pleasant day. See what I mean? D did you hear it? 
Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> so the thing with infiltrators is that they are a new unit. And if you look at the history... Now, number one, okay, I should say this with a caveat that Games Workshop a lot of times does nothing that makes sense. So you, you just want to keep that in mind as I say this with just a grain of salt. But given a past history with different units in different slots... GW very rarely changes units to a different slot. Now, we did see a lot of slot changes from, um, in 8th edition, a lot of, like, what used to be characters, like, uh, let's say a pain boy or something like that. A lot of the lieutenant models, they switched over to elites, but that was basically across the board. You know, um, some of the, the lesser heroes moved from HQ to elites. So that's one thing to keep in mind that they did do that fairly recently. What, three years ago, I think was eighth edition, but that is actually pretty uncommon in the history of GW and the whole scouts thing, to be honest, I don't know why they did it because as far as the lore goes, you know, the scouts are like space Marines in training, basically to put them in the elite slot just doesn't seem right. Now, it makes perfect sense for the, what are they called? Oh, God. The Scouts for Space Wolves. Oh, my God. I'm drawing a blank and it's going to irritate me. Anyway, Space Wolf Scouts. I'm pretty sure they've got a name like Longfang or something, but I know they're not Longfangs. Anyway, the point is Space Wolf Scouts have always been elite slots, but that makes sense because the Space Wolves do things differently, and all of their older dudes, their really experienced, battle-hardened guys, they uh, form the scouting troops, you know, scout ahead and all that. They don't put their rookies there, they put their veterans there. So that makes perfect sense for the Space Wolves to be in the elite slot because they are elites. But to put your rookies in the elite slot really doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm still of the thought that they're going to be phasing the, what are they called, firstborn or whatever. I'm, I, I guarantee you they're going to be phasing all of that out. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope they prove me wrong for all y'all's sake that has the firstborn. What are they called? Trueborn, firstborn, whatever. Trueborn is Drakari. I'm drunk. The point is... I would be extremely surprised if Games Workshop changed the slot for Infiltrators. Despite the recent hiccup with all of the 8th edition HQs turning some of them to Elites, besides that, and besides the Space Marine Scouts going to Elites, it's very, very infrequent for them to swap slots for a unit. So I think you're in good hands. I think you should go ahead and make the list of your dreams and go ahead and do whatever the heck you want. And even if... Now, I'm a little confused. I don't know if you're using Vanguard as, like, just a, a term. But, you know, a Vanguard detachment, if you were... If I understand you correctly, you want to make a bunch of elite stuff. You said you want to make, like, a Vanguard force. Well, I'm not sure if you mean Vanguard detachment. In that case, you don't need any troops. But if you're just talking about using Vanguard as a, you know, a general term and not a detachment, I understand what you're saying. So, but even if they did, think about this, even if they did move Infiltrators to the Elite slot, then you would just take a Vanguard detachment and you're still good. So I think you're pretty, pretty safe, um, Hidden Mudkip. And can I also say that your name, I find like, man, your your handle unsettles me in some way <laughs> hidden mudkip it's like it'd be different if you're like red mudkip or old mudkip or british mudkip or hungry mudkip any other adjective right before mudkip but hidden mudkip insinuates like you're just walking by and you've got no idea this mudkip is just sitting there lying in wait to do something to you i don't know find it find it unnerving if i was the hidden pimp cron <laughs> like it's just a weird, I don't know, it's just a weird thing. Anyway, I do greatly appreciate you calling in, and um, I'm going to contact you. I want to commission you to record several bedtime stories for me to help go to sleep at night. I just I just want to let you know that, so expect the email. All right, thanks for 
I was going to say write it in. Thanks for calling in, Hidden Mudkip, and we will uh, move on to the next segment. Want that or want that not? On this Want That or Want That Not, I'm covering the Warhammer Age of Sigmar Dominion box set for AOS 3.0. And it includes a bunch of Stormcast people and a bunch of, oh, what are they called? I forget what they're called. The Cruel Boys? I think they're Cruel Boys. Orcs. So, this is a $200 USD box, and let's see what we get in it. First off. We have, seemingly, a bunch of Stormcast people with spears and shields, and that's all well and good. I'm not exactly sure why the proportions are different than normal. They're the typical gold armor, the blue, just like you expect from the, what is it, the Sigmar's Hammers, Hammers of Sigmar, whatever their their um, Ultramarine chapter is that they always use. You've got um, two, four, six, eight, ten spearmen, and they each have a shield. And I find them to be proportioned weirdly, this whole set. And I don't know if they're trying to get away from the cartoony-ish, because Stormcast are slightly cartoony. They're very heroic and very over-the-top proportions. These people are, like, lean and a little scrawny, and they seem to actually be more realistically proportioned. So, I don't know exactly what's going on there. But I don't find them really impressive in any sort of way. I just, they're fine, I guess. Uh, they're not really not striking me. Now, keep in mind, I do play Orcs, and I do play Stormcast. So this box has a pretty good chance that I'm going to want it, right? It also has a pretty cool-looking character. Um, it's got wings. It's on stairs, because they like to do that for some reason. It's got a tree behind it. It's pretty cool. I like it. I think I like that character a little more than some of the other characters, so that's cool. There's another character with, like, a staff, and, I mean, that's fine, I guess. <laughs> it's like, I hate to be crapping on everything. They just, none of this is really striking me. They've got somebody that looks like a priest. He's got a hammer and a, and a staff. Um, then they've got this person. It's a, I think it's a woman with a staff. Looks like a psyker of some sort. That's all fantastic. Um, very realistic proportions, like I said before. It comes with several of these, like, bodyguard-looking people that have capes over their shoulders. That's another thing about this set, is their shoulders are not very large. Usually the Stormcast have these giant shoulder pads. Maybe this is what I'm talking about with the proportions. These guys don't have... These guys and ladies don't have huge shoulder pads. Not really sure why. Um, I'm not hating this, but it's just definitely a different look. They much They look much slimmer. And there's some people with, like, um, pole arms or axes, and they've got capes over their shoulder pads, which is kind of a neat look. They've got, like, a cloak, basically. And I do like that. I like these. They look pretty cool. Then you come to the big old thick boys, the guys with the shields and the giant hammers. Uh, don't know what they're called. Don't care to even look it up. You know who they are. They're the ones with the giant shields. They got the two-up save. I really like these guys. They are bigger. Now, once again, they're not cartoony proportioned. They are just larger dudes, but they're still in the more realistic proportions. They have a massive hammer and a giant shield, and they have a two-up save. Now, two-up saves are a pretty huge deal. If you're a 40k player, you're like, oh, who cares? Two-up save. No. Age of Sigmar, the average troop has a four-up save. Most heroes have a three-up save. To have a two-up save on this unit is pretty nuts. So it seems like they are like Retributors, but with a better save, but not quite as much impact for melee, because the Retributors have the Smash to Ashes, which they're one of my favorite units, that's the only reason why I even know that. But um, these guys are awesome. I really do like these guys with the shields. So the Spear and Shield dudes, like, whatever, they look fine, I guess. The Priest, the Psyker, meh, okay. The bodyguard-looking people with the axes on stabs, I do like. The lady with the wings, totally fine. But the guys with the giant shields, that that is making me turgid. I like those. I like them a lot. So, so far, the Stormcast stuff is kind of like, I'm going to give it a C+. It's, it's really kind of lackluster, in my opinion. It's just really not blowing me back in any way, really. Uh, let's go over to the orcs now, okay? With the orcs, you get about 20 hobgoblins, 
and they are like a new class for orcs, essentially, because we've always had knobs, orc boys, and grots, and then I guess snotlings. Snotlings are really small, but we've never had hobgoblins before, to my knowledge. I've never heard of them in this game. So hobgoblins are pretty cool. I don't know if this is just because I was always been a big Spider-Man fan and I like the hobgoblin. I don't know why, but I do like these hobgoblins quite a bit. And it also comes with a giant orc on this, I don't know, I don't even know what it is, like a weasel or something. It's this giant hairless thing, typical hero on a mount with a, you know, a pole arm and a shield. But once again, these orcs, these cruel boy orcs have a much more realistic proportion. Like they are, they could actually be a real creature. They're not the big ape looking orcs that we're used to with the you know, the big cartoony muscles and all that. This guy looks pretty cool on this mount. I like this orc way better than I like the Stormcast character. I also like the idea that I don't know if they actually are squig shields, like shields made of squigs, or it's a shield with a squig stretched over, but these guys have a bunch of squig shields on and squig armor plate, which I really like. There's also some sort of shaman that's pretty cool. I like him. Uh, there's not much to say. He's like in rags and he's pouring something out. There's someone with a cauldron that's a really cool looking model. I like him a lot. And then the rest of the orcs are just kind of very realistic looking. And I'm not hating it by any means. And I like the squig shields. To be honest with you, when I'm looking at these much closer, uh, I like the orc side way better than the stormcast side. I find the Stormcast side to be kind of meh, but I really do like the Orc side a lot. And I love this new aesthetic for them. So, um, 200 bucks for this. This looks like a relatively good deal. I mean, any one of these boxes, I mean, 20 Hobgoblins will be 60 bucks guaranteed. So, you know, you will be getting some value out of this. Now, one thing that does concern me, and I got screwed with this with the original Age of Sigmar set. Do you remember how Retributors, because I love Retributors, came in groups of three, but in the game, you can only take them in groups of five? Like, what the hell? What about the second Age of Sigmar, the uh, Soul Wars, Age of Sigmar, the Evocators, which I also love Evocators, came in sets of three, but you can only take them in fives. That kind of makes me mad. Then I look here, and I'm like, oh, here's three of the big shield dudes. Fantastic. Which means I'm not going to have a full set of them, probably. Now, maybe because they got the two-up save, they are just groups of three. I don't know. I don't care to look it up. Point is, I find this whole box to be kind of lackluster. I'm not really blown away. The Stormcast is middling to being kind of meh. Uh, like I say, C plus for the Stormcast side. And I'd give the Orc side a solid B. Like, I, I think that's pretty cool looking. I like the new realistic proportions on all this. I'm not sure I like the realistic proportions on the Stormcast, though. Because these Stormcasts are looking downright scrawny. Like, they are... They're vegan or they're something. They they don't have a lot of meat on their bones. So I, to be honest, this is the first box set. I mean, I bought the crap out of AOS 1.0 box set. I bought the crap out of the Soul Wars. I mean, I bought three of each or four of each. I mean, a lot. My whole Nighthaunt army is from that box set. um, And all my Stormcasts are from that box set, basically. So when I say that I'm not going to buy this $200 box set, it's kind of surprising to me, and it might be surprising to you, because I just find it very meh. Like, couldn't they have picked... I'm sure Stormcast are like Space Marines, they sell the best. But I really feel like you could have gone a slightly different direction. Why didn't you use half of this box to give some love to the Cities of Sigmar, or something like that? You know, have a bunch of troops, or redo the handgunners, or... <sighs> Just about anything besides Scrawny Stormcast. You could have done basically anything besides Scrawny Stormcast. So, and to be honest with you, I don't really know that we need more orcs, too. Like, I think the Hobgoblins are kind of a cool addition, but the rest of the orcs are just kind of orcs. I mean, they got spear spears and shields. BFD. I mean, I, I just don't see... I don't see the need for it. And meanwhile, there's some armies, like Flesh Eater Courts, that have, like, freaking five units... Or what about, what about Fire Slayers? Fire Slayers literally have three or four units. That's it for a whole codex. There's a million other armies that needed fleshing out prior to Orcs. Orcs already have the, um, the 
Ard Boys and the Bone Splitters and the Iron Jaws. And I mean, they already have lots of stuff. So I don't know that this was necessary. And to be honest, the only thing that I really would want this box set for is the Big Shield guys. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wait until the Big Shield guys are for sale as like a separate box. And it will probably be five of them, probably because you take them in groups of five. So I'm just going to bypass getting screwed by this box set of what I find to be lackluster models. And I'll just buy the one squad I want out of it. And that's basically it. So this, to be honest, is a want that not for me. I don't hate it, but I don't like it enough to split it or spend 200 bucks on it. Oh, well. Now it's time for Real Talk with Pimp Cron. In this Real Talk with the Pimp Cron, you better cross your fingers and knock on something woody, Earthlings. Pimp Cron is here to discuss the superstitious world of gaming. In a world where science is supposed to reign supreme, we find ourselves to be a very superstitious lot when it comes to our wargaming. Whether it is something we believe is fact or something we have observed to be true time and time again, we find ourselves giving credence to things that can't be proven scientifically. For instance, um, your friend Gary is a nuclear physicist, and will use every chance he gets to tell you your worldview is wrong because science! Meanwhile, if you happen to touch some of his dice, he will immediately retreat, with the soiled dice to a sacred moonlit hill in the countryside and proceed to chant his cleansing hymns in a robe while tossing the dice in warm goat's milk and stirring it with raven feathers. After a week of soaking, his dice are back to normal and he will go back to being smug. Gary is very serious about his dice. All right, so first on the list is girl luck. You may wonder... Why girls are usually the minority in gaming stores? Well, I'm here to tell you. It is most likely because they've been banned. And no, it's not some sort of alpha male ego trip that causes it. It's because women, well, they, they freaking rule at rolling the dotted cubes. In our weekly RPG I ran, my wife's dice rolling pretty much just broke the game. There was no situation she could not get out of with a lucky 20 whenever she needed it. I mean, it's it's truly ridiculous. I have some friends like uh, Beastman Josh, and he <laughs> he notoriously rolls terrible all the time, just terrible. Even when we do D and D or whatever, I'll be like, "Oh, you know, the um, difficulty rating is um, you know, ten on this, and you've got a plus seven, natural one, that sort of thing." So that causes me to have two prevailing theories. And it's either that uteruses contain some sort of tiny tesseract cube full of four-leaf clovers, and maybe some rabbit's feet, or maybe small invisible angels catch the dice midair, lovingly kiss the cubes clean of any bad luck, and gently lay them down on the table with the appropriate side facing up. I don't know which one it is, but those are my... That's what I'm working with right now, scientifically speaking. What about resetting the dice? If you ask any of my gaming buddies, they can tell you I have an annoying habit. And once you get past the nail biting and my sloppy eating and lack of volume control and constant nagging to join the Church of Cthulhu, you'll hear them say that the next worst annoying habit I have is resetting my dice. I've come to believe that I have a better chance of rolling, rolling well, I should say, if I pick up my low-scoring dice, usually ones and twos, but avoiding the higher numbers. I pre-roll my dice to get the ones out. I also have seen some people line all their dice up with sixes up or ones up with a similar effect. Now, you can tell me that statistically I have the same chance of rolling a six or a one, regardless of which dice I pick up. But if it comes to an important two-up save... You look me in the optical sensors and you tell me you're not going to pick up the lowest dice first. It's almost, in your head it almost seems like, okay, if this dice just rolled a 1, it's bound to not roll a 1 again. It's bound to roll higher than it is. Now, of course, scientifically I don't think there's any reasoning behind that. 
you know, because in a in a perfect world, obviously, if we're talking about quantum, the quantum mechanics behind dice rolling, you would have to know what the momentum and the trajectory and the force and the velocity and the weight and the weight balance and the center of gravity and all of that, not to mention the texture of the board it's bouncing on and all of that in order to really know or be able to predict what number is going to come up. But it seems to me like if it just rolled a one, it's not likely to roll another one. So if I need a two up, I'm going to be grabbing that dice that just rolled a one because it's probably not going to be another one. Until once every six times I do that, it still is a one. Oh well. What about the Laz Cannon Curse? It's called Laz Curse or the Miss Launchers. You know, like they miss. Yeah, they're so they are so common in my gaming group that a lot of people have stopped taking Laz Cannons if there's any option to do something else or take another weapon in that unit. Need a 3-up to hit and a 2-up to penetrate? <laughs> cool story, bro, but your last cannon just missed. Or you rolled a 1 to wound. Fantastic. You know that extremely expensive piece of weaponry that you bought to specifically do that particular job? Yeah, it like wasn't loaded or something. You You've got some like really bad maintenance on that weapon, or maybe the, the gunner's drunk. I don't know, you can make your own headcanon for it, but essentially it's not working the way you want it to. And there's also a little tidbit here, you never call them missile launchers. You call them rocket launchers, because if you call them missile launchers, they will miss. I know it doesn't make any sense, but 100% of the time, it's true half the time. Matching dice colors. Well, man, here's another one I'm I'm guilty of. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, if you want your dice to roll better, buy appropriately colored dice that match your color scheme of your army. I know this sounds crazy, but dice can be really racist and superficial. You put your dice in your transport that is a different color from your army paint job, and you can just concede the game. Your dice will do anything they can to sabotage those different, quote-unquote, miniatures rolls. I've tried time and again to explain to my dice cube that the army of a different color is worthy of respect and love. And it just replies with something that, to be honest, I would rather not say here. I don't want that on my show, you know what I mean? Seriously, though, I have a brilliant set of purple dice with gold pips to match my purple with gold trim Necrons, my otherwise known as Pimpcrons, in case you couldn't put two and two together. And ever since I bought those, all I have to do is whisper, Tesla, and they turn all sixes. Same goes for all my armies with matching dice. I'm not lying to you. Those purple and gold dice roll so many sixes for Tesla, it's not even funny. And it's because... It matches my army. Like, that is that is just... I'm pretty sure what it was one of Newton's laws. I'm pretty sure. I'm not... Don't quote me on it. It might have been Einstein. But they said something like, Thou shalt have the same colored dice as thine tiny men. Or something like that. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But it was in Old English for no reason at all. What about the new unit curse? So, you've just shelled out some serious cash on a sweet new model, spent time assembling it, and maybe even painted it, you know, if you're an elitist. Now you're ready for battle testing, and just can't wait to see what this baby can do. Next thing you know, oh, you're taking it off the table as a casualty. Gun barrel's still cold, mind you. It didn't even get to do anything. I just got a text from a friend the other day. It said, just, just played my brand new flyer. It didn't come in until turn four, killed three Marines, was then shot down. <laughs> wow, looks like we got a badass over here. I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me with a new shiny model. Part of it is obviously that people are scared of new models and you kind of want them dead. But that doesn't really cover the other things like your... New model comes in and rolls garbage to hit or can't save anything whatsoever. Horrible shooting or just dumb stuff happening to it. The best thing to do is get a couple games under its belt, let it die prematurely like you know it will, 
and then it will act normally. Boom. Problem solved. So, let me know if you have any other superstitions that you guys follow in your gaming group or in your friend group or whatever. And um, I think that's it for this show. Thank you to GameMat.eu for supporting the show. And thank you to all my beautiful, sexy, good-smelling Patreon patrons. And I will see you next week.